I'm Swimming Pool Steve, and I'd like to talk to you about how to install pool pumps better. There's a lot that you could potentially need to know because there's a lot of kinds of pool pumps and pipes and different kinds of connections, and it's going to take me forever to go over all of it. Let's get started. We're going to go step by step. So let's start with something useful that applies to every swimming pool pump, and then we'll kind of build on it from there. And I hope you give me a chance here because I think if you stick around for this video, it doesn't matter where you're at in terms of your skill level, and it doesn't matter what kind of pump you have, I can pretty much guarantee that I'm going to cover at least something in here that's going to be useful for you. And if I do, give me the benefit of the doubt, like, and please subscribe to this YouTube channel. So getting started here, when you install a pool pump, the tolerance that you're working with in here is, I'm going to say about one eighth of an inch, which is to say, if you're trying to install this stuff without the use of, you know, a measuring tape, something like that, you're just going to eyeball it. Probably it's not going to go very well. And I would recommend that you rethink your approach. I want you to use things like a tape measure. A little torpedo level is super handy for doing pump installations for all kinds of reasons, because at the end of this job, we want it to look good. It's really important it looks good. We only install it one time, but you look at it forever. You use it forever. So let's think about that stuff when we're installing the pool pump. So along that line of tolerance, one eighth of an inch, how does this apply? Well, basically what it comes down to is you're gonna have pipes coming around and they have to meet together at the pump here. And what you want is you want it to all be sitting naturally and not under strain. You don't wanna have to like, bend the pipe to get it to line up just right so that you can get the union closed. That's not a good long-term plan. You're probably going to end up with a leak. Worst case, you could end up with a break and then it might even cause like a flood or damage some equipment or something like that. So you really want to attempt to do this carefully enough so that everything fits together well enough that there's no strain on any of the connections. Next, and this applies to everybody, do not put a 90 right in front of the pump intake. That is, it's right in the instruction manual. We all need to read the instruction manual because it's very important when you're buying an expensive piece of equipment like this. They all say, don't have a 90 or a valve or another fitting right in front of the intake of the pump. Typically speaking, what you want to do is have five times the pipe diameter in a straight run in front of the intake. This is two inch PVC pipe. We've got about 10 inches of a straight run here. So just addressing this, this is a coupling. Ideally, I would prefer not to have this here at all. I was actually running out of materials while I was installing this in my test lab here. And you can even see the piece of two inch rigid pipe I had to dig up is pretty darn old, probably 20 years old out of the box. It's still good, it'll be fine. This coupling is not ideal, but I was very careful to make sure that I had square cuts on the pipe. I make, made sure that it didn't back off after I glued it in. So it should provide the absolute minimum amount of turbulence for that water that's traveling through here, which again is the goal by having the straight pipe going into the intake of your pump. If you have a pump now, maybe like 10, 20% of you are like, oh, I've got a 90 degree fitting right in front of my pump. and it, it's always fine. It's never been a problem. Maybe you're saying that. Please don't say that. It's, it's a problem. It shouldn't be there. It's in the instruction manual. The hydraulic engineering behind pumps these days, it's pretty deep. You know, these guys know what they're talking about. They say don't put a 90 in front of the pump and you shouldn't do it. Now talking about 90s, that kind of brings me to my next point here is the right, the right materials, the right tools, all that stuff. And there's so much to know. I think we have to take a minute here head over to the workbench and let's talk some more about the types of fittings and types of things that we're going to be working with when installing a swimming pool pump better. Okay, if we're going to do a better job installing swimming pool pumps, or just maybe one pump in particular, we need to talk about the materials that we need to use, the right stuff, the wrong stuff. There's a bunch of terminology, the tools you need to use. If we go over all of this, this is going to solve probably most of your questions in relation to how to install this pool pump better. So where should we start here? Let's talk about the pipe selection or the pipe material that we're going to use. The right stuff, Schedule 40, rigid PVC. This is the stuff that you want to be using. And I guess probably the easiest thing to mistake for the wrong thing would be DWV. Drainage Waste Vent Rigid PVC. That's not really the right stuff. It needs to have a pressure rating, and that's what we're looking for here. There, 
In some hardware stores, it's getting even more confusing because now they're making kind of a dual purpose pipe, which is the, it says right on it, DWV. So you're thinking, okay, this is not the right stuff. And it wouldn't be if it, unless it had the ASTM designation printed right on the pipe. Like if you read the, the wording here, does it say ASTM 2665 and ASTM 1785? If it says those two things plus DWV, it's still the right stuff to use. So is that it? That's all you can use is Schedule 40 rigid PVC? Well, I mean, yeah, in theory, that's the best stuff. Just use that. Why use anything inferior? Since we're talking about inferior plumbing stuff, let's talk about this guy right here. This is your flexible PVC. Man, this stuff gets a ton of hate online. And it, it is. It's inferior across the board. But it's still used commonly in cold climate places because it's more resilient to you know temperature fluctuations movement in the ground things like that it's hose not pipe it has a very low maximum uh, pressure like something like 60 psi versus 330 psi with rigid pvc or inch and a half pvc so it, it's not as good but it is commonly used you will see it used but the thing is is even if i made the concession and said Okay, maybe there's some times that you use this stuff because it's a cold climate, even though it's totally inferior, it kind of gets the job done. That would be an underground conversation. When you're talking about the pool equipment pad, it doesn't matter where you live or how cold it gets, you should be using the rigid PVC because it just looks way better, it works way better, it lasts longer, it's better for the flow dynamics because this is smooth on the inside and these striations in the, in the pipe, are a detriment to flow, something you want to avoid if you can. So those are your your base options. There are other things out there that you might have. You might have uh, poly pipe. It's basically going to look like this, except it's going to be solid black. And that's kind of an older product. It's something that you might find. You can transition over to PVC using a, a barbed by slip PVC adapter. You've got options on the table. If you can get to rigid PVC, that would be the best, undoubtedly, for installing swimming pool pumps. So what next? Well, let's move on to the fittings here. This is a big one. These three guys here, there are there's so much buzz on the internet and arguments and stuff like that about those fittings. And actually, I think I might be the cause of it. Uh, eight or nine years ago, I was really putting out a lot of content talking about these products in particular. This is a street elbow. This is your lowest of the low. This is the worst thing that you could use if you need to negotiate a corner with PVC pipe. And yet for some reason, the average pool technician in my area was using this as your standard elbow. Like every elbow, every 90 degree transition was made with this street elbow, which is the hydraulic equivalent of a brick wall. It, there's nothing to help the water negotiate the corner in any sort of efficient fashion. And so I really, really don't like these street elbows. Avoid these at all costs if you can. This is a short radius 90. There's nothing wrong with this. This is kind of like the 90 of choice for swimming pool installations. Only recently, since I started really harping about this, I think, you see a lot more street elbows and, or sorry, sweep elbows in installations. This is a long radius 90, short radius 90, long radius 90, or commonly called a sweep elbow. You have to be careful with these because they're not really that common yet. If you, if you go around and you ask for those because they're really good for flow efficiency, like these are, these are gonna be readily available everywhere and it's kind of probably what you're gonna end up using and there's nothing wrong with that. If you have the opportunity, you have the room, you can use sweep fittings where possible to make your system marginally more flow efficient, but be careful. Most of the sweep PVC elbows are DWV only, and you do not want to use that if you're going to be installing a pressure system. So let's, how, how are you going to tell the difference? Like I talked about pipe before and how you tell the difference with that and which rigid PVC is safe to use. Let's talk about, this is really important. So there are, you know, a bunch of fittings out there that can look like the right thing. You might have got a sweep elbow. You know, let's, let's talk about this guy here. And, you know, you're thinking, is this the right one to install? Here's how you check. So you see the length of this glue slip joint? This is an ABS 
90. Not pressure rated. It uses the yellow glue. You would never use this on a pool system. You'd use this to fix your sink. Look at the length of that glue, glue slip. Commonly about three quarters of an inch you'll find on a, an ABS 90. Sometimes over an inch and a half depth on this, this glue slip. And that's what defines a DWV connection for uh, non-pressure rated versus a pressure rated PVC connection. So double check any fittings that you're buying. Make sure that they're somewhere in the range of like one and three eighths inches minimum depth for the glue joint. So you're going to avoid the street elbow because it's an unnecessary flow restriction. You'll probably end up with the short radius 90 because they're widely available and affordable. If you can work a couple of sweeps into your system, all the better for flow, flow efficiency. Let's talk about how the fittings are going to relate to the intake of the pump. This is very important. If you do this wrong, you can damage your pump and almost certainly you'll reduce the service life of it. Never ever do this or that or that. That's okay. Just kidding. That's not okay at all. Don't do any of this. It's right in the instruction manual for the pump. What you need to have is a straight piece of pipe into the intake. This is very important. The length of the piece of pipe should be a minimum of five times the pipe diameter. Here we have a piece of two inch rigid PVC. If I was using two inch for my system, five times two inches, 10 inches straight pipe, in a straight run, no fittings, no valves, no anything like that, a straight run. And that is probably one of the most important things that you might take away from this video because people get this wrong all the time and the pump doesn't explode and die right away. So you think everything's fine, but the reality is, is you're, you're damaging the efficiency of the flow of your system, the hydraulic flow efficiency. You're shortening the service life of a very expensive component, the heart of your pool filtration system, and you're doing so unnecessarily. Now that you know better, you can install it better. So just take your pipe. Wait, hold on. I think we forgot something. We need to talk about something very, very important when it comes to swimming pool pumps. Threaded connections. Not every pool pump will have this. Some are going to have some different stuff, like... This is a PVC union. Some pumps come with these. They're, you know, made to fit and they just go right in. They come with the pump when you buy it. Bob's your uncle. Most pumps on the market, like this one we're looking at here, is one of, if not the most popular selling pool pump wet end of all time. And it's got inch and a half female threads. So we need inch and a half male threaded adapter. Now this one here has inch and a half threads, but the pipe size is two inch, not inch and a half. This is kind of a little bit of a specialty fitting, but I wanted to introduce you to it because you know, it's, it, it's pretty useful. Inch and a half pipe is a pretty big restriction to flow and wherever possible, I'd like to be using larger plumbing, especially on the suction side of pumps. So this, pump has an inch and a half thread. There's nothing I can do about that. There's no other way to attach. If I want to make this as flow as efficient as possible, I might explore using a fitting like this on the intake. But I think we can do better than this. Here's another example. This is just your regular inch and a half male adapter. Doesn't change size or anything like that. We could use this here. Get in there. Don't make a fool of me. Okay, there we go. We could use something like this. It's actually common. People do it all the time. Probably it works and probably it works for a long time, but I think we can do better than this. In fact, I know we can do better than this. So let's talk about how we can do better. So first of all, look at this guy right here. This fancy bad boy is a high temperature union threaded male adapter. Boy, that's a mouthful. Basically, it's the same thing, right? It's got the male adapter component, but also it's got that union component built right into it. Convenient, all in one. But it's got something else going for it here, and you might notice and it's kind of a different color. What's that all about? So that is CPVC, chlorinated PVC, and it's used for high temperature applications. 
this PVC, this stuff here, I mean, it's rigid and hard as heck, but if you take a heat gun and you just blast that with some heat, you'll turn it completely malleable in it. It's not great for something like a pool pump, which has the ability to generate a lot of heat. If we just went ahead and used one of these regular male adapters, what's going to happen over time very likely is that this is going to become misshapen or, or distort in some way just enough that we can develop small leaks. Small leaks here and small leaks here. And small leaks add up to big problems over time. And that's why we want to avoid it completely. We want to do this once. We don't want to be out here all the time revisiting this. Let's get the right stuff. This is a high temperature union, male adapter. And that would be a really good option here. I guess maybe that brings us to the point now where we need to talk about thread sealant. So this guy here has a, an O-ring on there already. And in theory, if I just thread that guy in and tighten it up with a wrench, that's all I'm gonna need to do. But in my experience, it doesn't work that well. I certainly don't want to start a fight here with pool technicians who maybe love to do it that way. It's just my experience. And my experience is, is that this O-ring lets me down and it doesn't really seal. And when I try to give it an extra tighten to stop a drip, the O-ring catches and distorts and then it can often make the problem worse. So let's talk about some very valid ways to connect things like a male adapter or a high temperature union. Number one thing to not do is use pipe dope. Stay off the dope, kids. Pipe dope is a petroleum-based product that goes on the threads. It's a thread sealant. You, you put it in there, but the problem with pipe dope is over time it dries and expands. And this is plastic, and the flange receiver is plastic. And this isn't, you know, metal or iron working. And if you make this tight in there, and then over time the thread sealant that's in there expands, it will crack the receiving flange here, and now you're into a new wet end on your pump. So that's, you just avoid it altogether. Don't use pipe dope. There might be some on the market now that says, you know, safe for PVC or CPVC. In my experience, I just, I, it was so deeply ingrained into me, just avoid pipe dope. Maybe there's new products on the market that are better. I don't know, I can't speak to those. I like tried and true. I don't wanna have a problem here. And so let's talk about ways in which we can make this threaded connection that is absolutely not gonna leak. Okay, so we've got our male adapter here. We have some Teflon tape or that there's other terms for it. I, I can't remember what the, the acronym is for it. I've always known it as Teflon tape or gas tape. Those are the two options. Teflon tape's the cheap one, the white one here, it's like, a quarter a roll or you know five for a buck something like that gas tape is much thicker noticeably thicker and it's also comes in colors um, blue and pink things like that for swimming pool equipment i just like the cheap stuff nice and thin it's not going to be so thick that it's going to bind in here and potentially break the flange again we're talking about plastic components here and you have to be very careful to not break this stuff and i'm going to go over more about that later but right now what you need to know is when you're using a product like this, there's a right way to wrap it and a wrong way to wrap it. We want to put it around in such a way that as we tighten the threads, the tape itself is wrapping even tighter around the threads. That when you do it wrong, as you thread in, it's backing off the, the tape. And then, of course, that defeats the entire purpose and you're not going to get a proper seal. Also, for what it's worth, this guy looks a little dirty. I'd probably give that a a clean if I were doing this for a permanent connection and not for an example here. So just to know that you're doing it right, the only way that I can I can recommend for you to make it just really easy to remember, hold the fitting in your left hand, take the tape and wrap it over the top. If the fitting's in your left hand and you're wrapping over the top, you're wrapping it the right direction. So that's one, two, three. Let me give it maybe like a full fourth and that's it. We don't want to go, oh, look at this. I did a, I did a bad job. Let's do this again. Okay. Fittings in our left hand. Let's kind of hold it there, push it in. So it's not kind of coming apart or falling off. Make sure that you don't cross thread this reverse thread it until it, the first couple should go in smooth. And we're just going to keep going here. 
hand tight. What you want to know here is that so often people will just crank this and crank this and crank this until it touches. And you don't want to do that. This is, again, this is all just plastic components. You want to do something that's hand tight plus about one quarter turn. Typically speaking, that's going to give you some really good results. You've got some options here for what you want to use. Channel locks, an oil filter wrench. I quite like these. They're, they're not fully adjustable, so they don't fit you know, to every application. But I like them because they have a rounded grip as opposed to a flat grip that you have here. For some things, like here, I can probably get this around. Let's see here. Is this big enough? Yeah, just big enough. Very carefully, I'm going to give it a little bit more turn here. And that's it. So this is not going to leak. And you might think, well, it's, you know, it's, it could be tighter. It doesn't need to be. I'm pretty strong already. I've got a, a pretty high hand strength. I cranked it fully tight. I gave it about a half turn more. That's all you need to do. It doesn't matter if it's close like this or maybe yours is out further. Well, then you probably just put more wraps of tape on it or maybe the gauge of your tape is a little bit thicker. Don't even worry about that. Go by hand tight plus about a quarter turn to a half turn. Of course, there's different hand strengths out there. We often refer to it as hand tight for a gorilla, just to kind of give you a, you know, a gauge. Now, don't go out there and try to, you know, take this on as a feat of strength, plastic components. You're going to break something. Just reasonably hand tight, half turn more. It's not going to leak. If you have maybe a problem where you've tried this and it's not working, you went through all the steps, you did what I said, you maybe even tried tightening it a little more after the fact, but still you have some drops of water. One, get down nice and close and inspect for small cracks in the flange. They can be very hard to see, so you could have something wrong that's causing a leak. But there is another option here. You could take something like this. You'd have to, this has been used now. We'd have to strip this off, clean it, and start again with something fresh. Wrap it with your Teflon tape like before, but then take some silicone and smear it around. Not silicone caulk or caulking. It has to be 100% silicone. Around there, same deal. Hand tight, but when you go to tighten it further with the wrench, maybe even less than a full one and a half turns because the added silicone makes the fitting more slippery and you're, you're going to get it in there further than you would if you weren't using any so you have to be careful if you add the silicone that you're not over tightening because now it's easier to over tighten than it was before so we've talked about a lot of stuff here we've talked about fittings we've talked about pipe you know we've talked about efficiency let's talk about some of the options that you have available for solvent welding this PVC. I call it gluing. Of course, it's not gluing, it's solvent welding. You need a primer and you need the cement. Now, you don't have to look too far to find somebody saying, well, I never use primer and my stuff's always okay. I will fight any man, woman, or child who says that not using primer is okay. Let's just leave it at that. You need to use it. We're doing a better job here so that we don't have to come out and revisit problems later. Use primer when you're solvent welding PVC. Big tip for you here. The primer comes in clear and it comes in purple. Do yourself a favor. Buy yourself the clear when you're doing a equipment installation. The purple is brutal stuff. It stains like crazy. If you spill it, it just makes a giant mess. And I mean, I've spilled it, so it could happen to you. So do yourself a favor, clear primer. Still try not to spill it though. When it comes to the solvent cement that you use, you could use a, a gray. There's a lot of like pool and spa grade stuff these days that you could be using. I like clear. Same thing with the primer. If I'm going to use a clear primer, I like a clear uh, cement as well. You can use gray. You can use any color at all, in fact, from the, you know, from the appropriate selections here. But the chance of you making a big mess of things go up quite a bit when you're talking about, you know, gray glue, things like that. I recommend using the clear. It's just as good. It will allow you to be a little more forgiving with getting drops here and there and that without making a big mess of things and painting your pipes and everything with primer and glue. Save yourself the trouble. Clear primer, clear glue when you're installing pool equipment. If you're in the trenches and below grade, that's a great time to use purple primer, gray glue. Um, if you're in the equipment room, clear is a great way to go. 
Yellow is never the right stuff. Yellow is ABS. ABS is not pressure rated. That's the wrong stuff. So never use yellow cement or yellow glue or whatever this stuff is. Not meant for pressure rated, not meant for PVC, not meant for swimming pool equipment. Okay, let's talk about a situation where you have barbed fittings. And those are the ones that use these clamps here. So the two situations that you'll really encounter this will be flex PVC where somebody has elected to use um, clamps instead of, you know, solvent welding it into a, a fitting. It's, it works. It's not my favorite thing, but it, it, you can use it for the pressures that swimming pool equipment operates at. As long as you put the clamps on correctly, tighten them properly, it's going to work. More commonly, you'll have black poly pipe, a pretty semi-rigid uh, black pipe, and it can be very, very difficult to fit it over the fittings here. With the black pipe, you use a heat gun, you heat up the ends, it allows you to put the fitting in, and it also allows you to tighten the clamps a little bit better because you're doing it while that pipe is nice and warm. This flex PVC is a real nightmare to get barbed fittings and you basically have to use a mallet to hit it in there. But the point of this that I want to show you here is like, I want you to use rigid PVC, but if you are using this stuff and you do have things like this, let's go over something very basic, but very important. Okay, that is what a lot of systems look like or a lot of connections. That is no good. That you will also see quite a lot because maybe that person read, oh, I'm supposed to use two, right? It's, it's better than one, but it's still not right. When you're making a barbed connection, that is the correct way in which to make the connection. One nut on each side, but importantly, both nuts still facing up such that you can access them with your nut driver from both sides. What's happening here is that there's tight points and loose points with this style of clamp. And by having them on with two and having them reversed like this, we can make sure that it's evenly tight on both sides. We're not gonna end up with a small leak in this spot. Clamping barbed fittings is a little bit tough and that's why you have to go the extra mile here. And since we're going the extra mile, you're gonna be using a 5 16th nut driver not a standard screwdriver when you tighten these. Of course, you could use a socket and a ratchet as well. Uh, you just have to be careful because you easily can break these. You know, this is not like working on your exhaust on your car. This stuff can be broken pretty easily. You're probably not gonna break it by hand with a nut driver, but you probably could pretty easily with a ratchet. There sure is a lot you could potentially need to know in order to install a pool pump better. So let's go ahead and unpack more of this mystery here. There's a few things in particular we need to talk about. Let's talk about pipe size to start with, because this is where a lot of poorly installed equipment setups start with your pipe size selection. So I guess we'll start with the most simplistic, which is going to apply to most swimming pools um, or most entry level swimming pools, let's say, which would be inch and a half for the suction line inch and a half for the pressure side. It's, it could be more complicated. There could be multiple pipes, things like that. But in the most simplistic sense, inch and a half pipe in, inch and a half pipe out. That is an acceptable installation. I wouldn't want to see that on a 20 by 40 swimming pool with 35,000 gallons of water in it. But in terms of, you know, smaller entry level pools, especially a lot of older swimming pools, one and a half inch pipe in, one and a half inch pipe out, it's okay. It works. It's not super efficient. It's, it's not good for a lot of volume. So how could that improve? Well, I'll tell you what you could do, but what you can't do. So instead of having inch and a half pipe and inch and a half pipe, instead what we're going to do is we're going to upgrade to two inch pipe on the suction side here. This isn't something that you can do on every swimming pool, obviously, but just in terms of what is considered acceptable standards for swimming pool installations, you can have a two inch suction line and you could have a two inch pressure line, just like the inch and a half. But here's something that you would never want to do. You would never want to have inch and a half suction and then a two inch pressure line. You can't do that. You can have two inch suction and inch and a half pressure. 
So it's a little confusing there, or it might seem to be on the surface level. But basically how it works is the pump needs back pressure in order to operate properly. If we have a small supply of water trying to push or feed a larger supply of water, the pump isn't designed to operate like that. Conversely, you can have a larger suction line and a smaller pressure line because there's some back pressure on the pump and it's designed to operate in that way. So is it a benefit to have like a two inch suction line and an inch and a half pressure instead of just inch and a half and inch and a half? Almost certainly that would, that would be a benefit. I mean, there's more considerations going on here. There is a lot happening with a swimming pool installation because I don't know anything about your pool, so I don't know how many suction lines you have or how much turnover you need. I can only teach you in a general sense about swimming pool pump installations, and then you can interpret this information to apply it to your situation and make better, more informed decisions on things like how your swimming pool pump is installed. This is true for whether you plan to install this pump yourself or whether you plan to hire a professional. An informed homeowner wants to know that the job is being done right, and one of the ways that you can do that is watching a video like this and learning all about pump installations and how to do it correctly. Like if your installer showed up and did that and said, there's your professional pump installation, where's my money? You need to know that. Even if you're not doing the job yourself, you would need to know that information. So we've touched on pipe size in the sense that you, you can have larger suction lines then the pressure side lines. You can also, ha also have equal inch and a half in, inch and a half out. You can have larger pipe in and larger pipe out, like two inch in and two inch out. Also would work for a lot of swimming pool installations. That's okay to do, but we're going to avoid having the larger pipe located on the pressure side and a smaller pipe on the suction side. We need to talk more about pipe sizing and how you transition between pipe sizes because who knows what you have? You could have pipes of different size or your new equipment has different port sizes than the pipes that you're using. You would have two inch pipes for your system and the pump you bought only has inch and a half threaded. Well, you could buy something like this. It's a little bit hard to find. Inch and a half male threads with a two inch female slip receiver. So you're transitioning to two inch pipe immediately out of the suction side here of the pump. That would be a good option for you. Unfortunately, with this just being a regular PVC male adapter, as opposed to this high temperature union or high temperature union male adapter, this is more likely and more prone to develop leaks over time because it can't tolerate heat in the same way that these can. And sometimes pumps can generate a lot of heat, especially on the pressure side connection here. So maybe one option you could look at is so now we've made our inch and a half connection here but you have two inch pipe and you're trying to figure out a good way to transition over. What you might want to look at is a reducer bushing. In fact, just in general, you need to know what a reducer bushing is for as far as PVC plumbing goes, because these are very, very common to need and use all over the place. So what, what we have here is a two inch coupling, no different than a you know two inch 90, same size. And this guy, I mean, it doesn't fit in there now because it's a dry fit, but when you primer and uh, glue that, it'll slide right in, and Bob's your uncle. Now you've got inch and a half on one side and two inch on the other. So we could put a short pipe connection there. We could put a longer one in, you know, something to that effect, you know, and then transition up. It really depends on the situation with your suction side manifold. That's something that we're going to have to explore more in depth if we're going to learn more about how to install pool pumps better. Okay, here we have one example of a suction side manifold. As you can see trailing off the side of the screen, we have multiple pipes converging into one pipe which feeds the pump. And I kind of mocked it up in a realistic sense here. Everything's in two inch except for that uh, transition at the pump two inch and a half. So, and from here, you probably would have, you know, some, some valves of some description or another on each line. And each line might represent, let's say, one might be the skimmer line to your pool and the other might be the main drain line to your pool. This would be a very common setup for swimming pool pump installations. This component right here, perhaps including the valve components as well, is what I would term the suction side pump manifold. A manifold is basically just converging pipes where you have multiple pipes 
coming into one trunk line, commonly you would have individual control over flow and isolation via valves on individual lines before they converge into one. Not every pool would be like that, but that would be what you would commonly see for a pump installation which is done better. Since we're talking about doing things better, let's talk about valves for a minute because that relates to the suction side manifold. I have two common examples here. There's a lot of different options out there, a lot of different manufacturers and configurations. What you see here is a ball valve. And what you see here is a diverter valve. So they're a little bit different. And in terms of what you should use for your swimming pool, these two valves represent basically what 90% of the people out there or more should be using for their swimming pool installations. This is kind of your lower cost alternative. This is a little bit more money if you don't mind paying for quality, which is probably going to outlast the lower cost alternative. Now, what you see here is a union. And I want to point out something very important to you if you're working on swimming pool equipments or installing swimming pool pumps. I consider this here to be the lowest common denominator in terms of the quality of valve that I will endorse for you to use in a swimming pool. I do believe that diverter valves of all brands, Pentair or Prayer or Spears or Jandy, uh, there's so many great options out there. This is a lower cost alternative, but I will still use these and have confidence that it's going to work properly and have some longevity to it. What I will not do, and I do not endorse that you do, is purchase valves that look quite similar to this, but they lack this union component. First of all, the union component is useful in and of itself, but more so the union component to me represents a level of quality, one step above any which are manufactured without that union. I don't care who's making the valve, if they've made it without unions, it's like a price point valve to meet a very, very low number, but the valve is not useful. It's very hard to turn. It fails to seal properly right out of the box or within a short period of time. Eventually the handle becomes so hard to turn that you will end up snapping the handle off and probably hurting yourself in the process. They're not serviceable, you can't open the system, just don't do it. If you're looking for cheap valves, these are the cheap valves. And if you're like, hey, Steve, this is, this is still expensive. Yeah, it sure is. And unfortunately, you might need a whole bunch of them for your pool system. Some advanced pool systems might have 20, 30, 40, 50 valves, if you can believe that. Some pool systems might only need three. If you want to make the investment in diverter valves, I do endorse it. This one in particular might look a little funny to you because it has a union component on all sides here. Not all diverter val valves have that. In fact, this would kind of be a, a less common one, but this was the one that I had in my spare parts bin to show you here. You don't need unions when you don't need unions. So you don't necessarily need ones that look exactly like this. The most common ones in the market won't look like this. They'll just have straight connections that you glue into and that's it. No union component at all. And there's nothing wrong with that. Those are the most common ones. If you need unions, you can pay a little bit extra and get ones that look like this. So just to verify for you here, what you can do, as you can see, I have a three port here and I have a two port here. Two-way valve, three-way valve, ball valve, diverter valve. So putting that all together, two-way ball valve, three-way diverter valve. My point, let's say you only need the two-way function. Pretend this isn't here and it just looks like that. Well, they make those two and they're super common. And if you want high quality valves, you can buy two-way diverter valves like this. And you can use that every place where you would otherwise be using something like this. It really depends on the quality of your installation, your budget for the job. You know, these are lower quality than these, but I wouldn't, you know, have an above ground pool 
fit with you know hundreds or a thousand dollars worth of valves that really are unnecessary perhaps overkill for the situation when these probably would have been a more economical smarter choice for the job so it really depends on a pool by pool situation what's the right valve to be using let's talk about something that's going to apply to a lot of pool owners out there let's say that you've read about things like flow efficiency you want to, to consider having two inch pipe installed through your entire equipment set because you've read that that is something that is going to help reduce the uh, inefficiency or the resistance to flow of the water passing through your system through the equipment set which is where the vast majority of your friction loss happens through a swimming pool filtration system so you want to make some improvements there you want to have two inch pipe here's something you can't do you have one pipe only it's your skimmer line you have no other suction lines in your pool. You really should not. Here we go. We've got a two inch coupling with a one and a half reducer bushing. So is that it? And then we can just install two inch pipe all the way to the pump. There we go. Would that work? I definitely would not do that. What's happening here is we're not considering water velocity and flow rates you can potentially change something like pipe size in your plumbing system but it has to make sense from a flow perspective this pipe here in a swimming pool suction line installation should have no more than six feet per second of water velocity this applies to all swimming pools and this comes from the vgba the virginia graham baker act which is the standards for anti-entrapment in swimming pools no suction lines should ever uh, have more water velocity than six feet per second in an inch and a half pvc pipe that's equal to approximately 38 gallons per minute so 38 gallon per minute safe maximum two inch pvc being larger at six feet per second water velocity can have more water flowing through it 65 gallons per minute approximately so 38 maximum versus 65 maximum in addition to being the safety limits these numbers also coincide exactly with the upper limits for laminar water flow laminar water flow is very important fast moving water moves with a lot of turbulence and this turbulence creates friction and inefficiency in flow slow moving water moves very efficiently and that's called laminar flow when you exceed laminar flow rates or the maximum laminar flow rates what happens is, is you introduce inefficiency to the system but not in a small hardly measurable way but in a very large extremely quickly accelerating logarithmic type scale the more water you try to push through the pipe the faster you try to push it the more inefficiency friction and ultimately resistance to flow that you're encountering by introducing that much flow through a small pipe so of course we've got the efficiency standpoint we've got the safety standpoint so we've got some numbers that we can work with in terms of how to design this suction side manifold properly if all of this sounds pretty confusing to you and maybe way more technical than you were expecting such is the nature of swimming pools and this is why professionals exist you you can and should hire a local professional to evaluate your whole setup install the system for you i absolutely endorse doing that and it's important to note not only should you consider doing it and you know i don't really have a dog in the race here i don't make the pump i don't sell it you know you do what you're going to do i just want you to be informed so you can make informed decisions as a pool owner and here's something you need to know if you're going to install pool pumps better if you endeavor to install your pool pump yourself you might void the warranty such is the nature of the pool industry in the modern day internet sales and brick and mortar sales are sharply divided there are product lines which are available to the public via the open line something like the internet for example and then there are product lines which you can only buy from a brick and mortar pool or spa professional while the products might be similar the ones on the open line and the protected dealer line quite often you'll find that the open line has a limited scope limited selection 
products with less features and almost certainly less warranty. Certainly, you could argue there's a lower price point attached to it if you buy it and install it yourself. But if you consider that you're buying basically a pool pump and motor with a computer attached to it, it kind of makes sense that you probably want to have your maximum warranty protection with this thing. It's supposed to be fine. It's supposed to run for years. But what if it doesn't, right? There could be a problem with it right out of the box. And if you order it online, whose problem is it and who's going to deal with the pool while you're trying to box the thing up and send it back and argue with the internet over whose problem it is? So again, I, I just want you to be aware. I don't have a dog in the race. I just want you to know you might be subject to less warranty if you install the pump yourself. Go ahead and do it if you want to, especially if you think that you can do a better job or you have no other options or all other sorts of valid reasons. Just know it in advance so that you can make an informed decision and be aware that if you purchase from a brick and mortar dealer, you're probably going to have more options available to you and you're probably going to have more warranty protection as a result. And further to that, like the pump was dead out of the box. It, ha it could happen to a professional too they're probably going to handle it for you. They're probably going to put a temporary pump in your pool because they know that if we just let it sit for a week or two or three months or however long it takes to get a new pump in your hands, your pool is going to turn green. It's going to be a mess. It could cause other problems and some of those problems could be expensive. So that's the advantage of purchase, purchasing from a professional versus purchasing from the internet, installing yourself. I mean, there's an argument to be made on both sides and I honestly don't care which one you choose. I just want you to be armed with that information. Let's move on. Okay, here's a common situation. You have inch and a half plumbing. We'll call this one the skimmer. We'll call this this one the main drain over here. Probably a valve on each, hopefully. But you want to transition to two inch pipe. You've heard the advantage that could be had. You do have multiple suction lines. If you had only one suction line, forget about it. If you have three or more inch and a half lines for suction that are in use all the time for the filtration side, you can use two inch pipe just the same as you've seen here. You could add as many T's and as many 90's as you need to for each of your suction lines. And you can and should benefit from having them all converge at a larger trunk line to avoid creating a choke point here on the suction side manifold. This is one of the main points that I want pool pump owners and installers to take away from this video is I just want you to avoid creating this, this choke point here because it's so common to see. The installation that you see right here, we have these inch and a half pipes. We would add the reducer bushings and there you go. We've, we've got two inch and a half lines. We transition them to two inch. We benefit from the laminar flow of up to 65 gallons per minute through the filtration set. Whereas if we kept the two inch and a half lines, each one could deliver up to 38 gallons per minute, but the trunk line being inch and a half still only can flow at 38 gallons per minute before sharp efficiency loss. And you're gonna be exceeding 38 gallons per minute. Some inch and a half systems are running up to 80 gallons per minute with a ton of efficiency loss. This is where you fix that problem. You have to be careful when you're doing something like this because this really is a pool by pool consideration. Not every system is the same. You can't just do this across the board, but I'm giving you an example here of what I consider to be kind of the bare minimum. If you want to transition to two inch, you have to at least have two active suction lines in your pool and you have to understand things like maximum safe flow rates per suction line. Well, what about this? Does this work? You bet it works. Valve on each line, same thing. I totally would agree with this. If I were to make one comment on an installation like this, I think you might notice, well, it kind of looks like this line probably will have an easier time flowing than this suction line. I would agree with that statement. So if this were my pool and this were the exact situation I was dealing with my, with my suction side manifold, here's how I would handle it. In a swimming pool installation, typically what you want to see for filtration is you want to see approximately 75% of your flow coming from the skimmer line and 25% of your flow coming from the main drain line. You might not even have a main drain. That's common these days with swimming pool installations and especially with vinyl liner and sometimes with even fiberglass and concrete installations these days, there is no main drain. Yours could be totally different, but a lot of pools have a skimmer, and a main drain. 
if we had a valve here and a valve here, as you should to be able to isolate and control flow to each line. On my skimmer line, I would leave that open all the time. On my main drain line, commonly speaking, I close it just a little bit. Yes, there's perhaps a little bit of flow efficiency loss from this, but also, optimally speaking, I want the majority of my flow to be coming from the skimmer line. So in an installation like this with a suction side manifold shaped thusly, I would definitely elect to have the straight line going in to be the skimmer line since, since this is the one that's going to have the majority of flow most of the time and I want that flow to be as energy efficient as possible. The main drain line is already going to be experiencing some restriction anyway, so it doesn't bother me as much to have this one following a slightly harder path in order to get into the pump. So long as we're observing the straight run of pipe in front of the, the pump suction inlet, then we're doing good. This one's actually a little bit short because if we're going to use 2 inch pipe, 5 times the pipe diameter would be 10 inches of straight pipe and we're a little bit short there. So we would need a longer pipe and we would need to space this out. And that brings me to a point that I definitely think a lot of pool pump owners would benefit from knowing. Let's say this was you. You had that much, or maybe even less than that, and you're like, is this okay? Can I have, you know, all this stuff right up there close to the pump? Well, as we've identified, you really shouldn't. There's, there's tolerances that we're supposed to be observing here, and your argument is, well, these pipes, they come up from the ground, like right here, what the heck am I supposed to do? The pump's right there. I don't have the room for all the fittings and the valves and the different things that I'm going to need. To an experienced pool pump installer, you just would change something. You're not afraid to cut into and make changes to the PVC system in the same way that a pool owner might, you know, be apprehensive about doing something like that. They want to minimize their work. There comes a point where the, the path of least resistance isn't to fight around with a too busy, too tight installation. It's to take a step back and give yourself something you could work with. So what I might do in this situation is I wouldn't be afraid to go ahead and get my shovel out, expose the area around the pipes, and maybe I can make a pipe configuration which will allow me to move them further and have them exit up from the ground maybe six inches or a foot further from the pump. Or maybe if I look really carefully at the pool pump pad installation, I might be able to reorient or move my pump a little bit such to facilitate getting that straight run into the pump without crowding my situation with all the valves and fittings that I'm working with. Something an experienced installer would, would do, or more so avoid doing, very rarely do you put fittings close to each other. More commonly, you do something like, I don't know, that. There we go. And the reason why we do that is, one day in the future, oh no, the pump died, I gotta change it, and it's glued in, what am I gonna do? Well, you cut, you just cut a piece off, and boom, we glued it back in. When you have this situation going on already, and you're needing to make a change, well, geez, we're gonna have to do some major surgery here to go ahead and cut all this stuff out and rebuild it. And what if what, what I'm holding in my hand isn't just a T and a 90? What if these are two diverter valves or some sort of special fitting that costs hundreds of dollars? Well, you could look at things like you could cut the pipe sheer and you could use a rotary tool to strip that out or you can do the same process with heat carefully, uh, needle nose pliers and a hacksaw blade. There's a couple of options, but none of them. None of them are good options. Way better if you can always leave yourself room to work with. People tend to really crowd pool equipment installations and I get it. It's just not something you really care about that much. You just want it to take up a small amount of space over in the corner. But you make your life difficult when you do stuff like that. Space things out, give yourself more room. If you're bringing pipes up out of the ground for your suction side or for your return side manifold, don't stack those pipes three inches next to each other. Give them eight inches or a foot in between. That's going to give you enough room to do stuff like this. Like it takes up a lot of room. So you have to plan ahead and don't be afraid to take a step back, cut into the system, make a change, dig around the plumbing, expose and move it. Do something because we're only installing this pool pump one time. It's going to run for years, if not decades. And you want to do it in a way that looks good. It's easy for you to work with and it lasts a long time and you want it to be efficient. So there's a lot going on here that really pushes you towards taking the extra time to do this as good as you can. 
We've talked a lot about the suction side here, but just for a moment, let's talk about the pressure side connection. So same thing as the suction side, you can use a regular male adapter, but this especially, even more so than here, is going to be subject to heat damage. And it's going to cause staining and leaking. And you can even see this pump here has had this experience already, where it's developed a leak here, and that's from using a regular PVC Schedule 40 male adapter. It's really just not the right tool for the job, and the high temperature threaded male adapter union is definitely the way to go. If you have this option, you always want to go this way. But it's worth mentioning that there's a lot of stuff out there modernly that isn't using this. A lot of the pool pumps out there are coming with unions already. They might have threads on them, they might be a proprietarily sized thread, but ultimately you're not dealing with that standard inch and a half threaded connection for a lot of modern day swimming pool pump installations. So this brings up a really, really common question that actually is pretty hard to find an answer for. But I absolutely know the answer to it, so let's talk about that right now. So this guy here, we talked about it before, it's CPVC. It's a special heat rated PVC. Take a look at this guy. Does your pool equipment setup use these on, could be on the pump, could be on the filter, could be on the heater? If so, this is an example of a CPVC union, the likes that might come with something like a Hayward TriStar variable speed pool pump. They come with these, these exact unions here. And when you read the unions, it says CPVC. And you're thinking to yourself, well, that's a great thing, right? Because as we've already identified, this heat rated stuff is excellent to use for high heat connections, things like swimming pool pumps. So if this were a TriStar instead of a super pump, what you would have is right out of the box, you'd have one of these. They come with the pump, which is fantastic. And better than that, look how big they are. This thing is a two inch native port for this slip joint. The pipe I'm holding is two inch, but also if I had, let's say a two and a half inch coupling, that two and a half inch coupling will glue and fit straight over the outside. So this is great for those uh, pool systems that are really high capacity, high volume. They need lots of flow. They use large plumbing. You wouldn't want to use an inch and a half threaded port on one of these kinds of pools. And that's when you get into this kind of stuff here, which is larger in size and also CPVC material, which is what I want to talk about. This is one of the most confusing things that gets people. If you don't know, you know, installing swimming pool equipment every day, even some people who do don't have the answer to this. This is a CPVC fitting, essentially. Pretend there's no pipe in it. We're going to glue the pipe. What glue do you use for this? Do I need to buy a separate bottle of CPVC solvent cement in order to make this connection? Or can I just use the other stuff? I'm using clear or gray or the blue pool and spa grade. Could I use those on a CPVC union? Yes. Here's how it works. CPVC is heat rated. CPVC glue is also heat rated. This stuff is not but it will make a sound connection. The bond is true, but it is not a heat protected bond. If you had a worry about this fitting letting go due to a heat related failure, then you would use the CPVC glue on this to bond the PVC pipe to the CPVC fitting. Very important. This is something that really doesn't come up for residential grade pool installations. I can't imagine an installer taking the time to use CPVC glue here on a swimming pool installation. And I'm talking a pump or a heater or anything that makes a lot of heat. Because this is the connection point I'm kind of worried about here. These threads with my thread sealant could become a problem. This slip joint on this this connection, first of all, is super long, way deeper than, you know, there's a two inch one. Comparatively speaking, that's at least a half an inch deeper for the slip joint. So this is already a very, very strong connection. And I have every confidence that no matter whether this is a pool pump or a pool heater or anything else, if we're talking residential grade, you don't need CPVC glue or the solvent cement is the proper name for it. You can use any of the regular PVC solvent cements that you're using, clear, gray, blue, whatever you're using for your installation. 
This will be a sound connection. You will just not have the heat protection rating like you would need if you were doing a commercial installation and there's an inspection for building code to make sure that we're uh, adhering to heat tolerances. This would then have to be CPVC, but then also the pipe would be CPVC and I'd be charging you a million dollars for the installation. Talking about our pressure side connection here for a moment, go ahead and remove that and just for simplicity's sake. For illustration only, again, this one's superior. Let's talk about some stuff you're not gonna do. Street elbow. Nope, not gonna do it. So, street elbows in general, you can just get rid of these things. I, if, you can, if you can get away with using anything else other than this, do so. So now we've got a regular elbow. Would I use that one? You know, like that? If you read the instruction manual, you might be lucky to find a tolerance for this for how much vertical and horizontal pipe run you need before you hit a fitting, and I would suspect that you'll find that this does not meet the tolerance that you're looking for. Most likely you're looking at something like that as your minimum amount if you're doing a short radius 90. Now in an ideal situation, what you're going to find is that if you use a sweep 90 in this position, it obviously is going to stand up higher than this guy here. Like it's gonna start in the same spot, but it's gonna finish right about there. What's significant about that is we have a filter that's coming right next in line. No matter what kind of pool installation you have, the pump comes first, the filter comes second. So we're coming right out of the pump and we're going right into the filter and the filter has an inlet. What height is the inlet on the filter? This is super important when you're installing a pump and a consideration you have to have before you can make any decisions about the fittings you're gonna use, how long the pipe is gonna be cut, any of that stuff. You have to know the inlet height. So let's say we've got an inlet height right about there. Well, I mean, that would show that we've got lots of room. I could probably have, you know, a 90 up like that, you know, with a couple of inches on each side, and that's gonna be A-OK, -okay, no problem. If I can locate myself a pressure rated sweep elbow and locate it in this position, I would say that's even superior to the short radius 90. Just avoid the street elbow most of all. Like even like this, I wouldn't use this thing way up here either. Just don't use it at all. Since we're talking about that connection from the pump to the filter, I want to discuss an important consideration here for cartridge filter owners. If you have a sand filter, or if you know about sand filters, you know it has a backwash setting. When that's where, you know, it's pumping water to waste, and that's how the, the sand filter is maintained to be clean. So, when you have a cartridge filter, you don't usually have one of those. And because of that, let's say you had a heavy debris load in the pool, and you want to pump it out, but you don't necessarily want to send it right into your filter, because it's all just going to clog up your filter, now you're going to have to perform your filter maintenance early. It would be great if you had an option to pump to waste with a sand filter, maybe even with a DE filter that has a valve, you might have an option to divert the water that the pump is pumping. Instead of going through the rest of the filtration set, it's diverted to waste. It's, you know, you use a lay flat hose that you roll out or there's a hard plumb connection that just takes the water away and allows you to drain the water from your swimming pool, either because you're vacuuming or because there's just too much water and it's over full, it's convenient to just turn a valve and pump set some of that water away and be done with it as opposed to dragging out a submersible pump and dropping it in your pool and plugging it in. The point of this, you might want to consider adding a diverter valve, a three-way diverter valve in between your pump and your filter. If you don't have a way to pump to waste with the type of filter that you have, which again, cartridge filters being the most common ones, you would benefit from installing a three-way diverter valve in between the pump and the filter, such that when you want to, or when you need to, you could change the handle positioning, and now you're pumping to waste instead of pumping all of that into your filter. If I had a cartridge filter, I would definitely want to have a three-way diverter valve installed in between the pump and the filter to facilitate that pumping to waste. When it comes to electricity and swimming pool pumps, this is kind of a worst case scenario from a safety perspective because there's, you know, a little bit of everything going on here and it certainly has the potential to be a dangerous or deadly thing if not respected and not handled by qualified people. When it comes to giving advice about electrical installations for swimming pool pumps, 
but this is something I've got quite a bit of experience in. I've got a lot of training in both electrical theory and practical electrical, but I also did at one point in my career for a major manufacturer of swimming pool equipment. If you called the 800 number on the side of your pump, I was the guy that picked up the phone to talk to you about the pump. And man, was there ever a lot of questions from people who just say, I just need to know where to connect the two wires. I know there's two wires, there's two places to put them. Where do I put it? It's such a simple question, but we won't answer that question for you. The elementary nature of your question reveals that you are not educated on the subject matter, which is electricity, and there would be liability in just trying to give you information. Oh, just put the, the black one on the left and the red one on the right or something like that. Well, what if we're not understanding your situation or what if you have a unique situation or who knows what's going on with your power? There could be, you know, the wrong voltage. There could be anything going on here that the person on the phone wouldn't want to take responsibility for. And, you know, this is your safety and a piece of an, ex you know, expensive equipment that we're talking about here. So double the reason to not give you what sounds like such a simple answer but I'm gonna meet you halfway. I'm gonna give you some information about electricity and swimming pool pumps because let's look at this from the perspective of, I'm a pool owner and as a pool owner, I wanna know everything about my pool to the extent that I wanna make sure everything's done correctly and safely and all that good stuff. Maybe you're not even looking on how to wire a pool pump yourself. You're really not interested in that information. You hired a guy, but you're looking at what they did and you're not necessarily sure if it's done correctly. So let's talk about that because as a pool owner, you should definitely have the ability to take a look at your equipment and understand things like, is my pump electrically safe? Has it been hooked up properly? You should, I strongly endorse, that you speak to a local electrician. If you're not an electrician yourself, why burden yourself with this? And there's so many little things you would need to know according to the NEC or the CEC, depending on if you're located in Canada or the USA, the type of connectors you can use, the type of wire you can use, the sizing, the breakers, do you need a GFI? All of that stuff is going to be unique to you and hard to find information if you're not an electrician. So from the perspective of an owner, I want you to look at where the wire goes into your pool pump. There's a couple of different kinds of common electrical connector that you might know as a homeowner. There's Romex or Lumex wire. It's white. That's probably what's running inside the walls of your home. If that's what you have going to your pool pump, no, no, that's not acceptable for this wet area application. And usually pool pumps are outside and that's not outdoor wire. So you might see something called BX. It's armor shielded. And this is very common for like commercial installations, commercial buildings of all kinds. You use BX wire. It is armor shielded, which is great, but it's not waterproof. So it would not be suitable for a swimming pool pump application. There's a couple of different things which are suitable for swimming pool pump applications here uh, in terms of wet connects or any sort of electrical connector, which is approved for wet area use. There could be conduit, you could have cab tire like you see here. There's all sorts of good options, but they're usually more expensive than the other options, like a regular half inch L16 connector like you'd use for a standard box connector for any residential electrical application. A dollar or two versus the seven or $10 or even 20 or $25 for some higher end wet connect stuff for your pool pump. I get the inclination to cut corners or use something that looks, ah, it's kind of the right thing. This is why you should speak to a professional about something like this, because you would just use an L16 connector and not realize it's not waterproof, it's not made of the right materials, it's going to corrode here and break off and cause all sorts of problems. So definitely speak to an electrician. Also, for what it's worth, my pool pump is for a test lab installation here. Even what I'm showing you, I don't think that I'd allow this. I would want to see a 90 fit connector here instead of this one coming straight out. Let's also talk for just a moment about bonding wires. Bonding and grounding are two different things. As it applies to a swimming pool, this is very, very important information. Not something that you should have to be playing with or working on your own, but you should know what this wire is, what it does, and why it matters if you don't have one. If you see an empty bonding lug 
on your pool pump, that's a problem. I'd contact the local electrician, have them come in, verify the existence of the equipotential bonding grid around your pool via testing with their multimeter, and then they would make a new attachment so that they could bring the bonding wire over to your pool equipment area. And then in addition to your pump, they would do your heater casing and the control box for your saltwater chlorinator or automation unit. That's how these things are designed to work. It's a low uh, resistance connector that attaches every piece of metal in and around your swimming pool, forcing it to have the same electrical resistance, essentially none. This prevents shock and electrocution from happening by way of somebody acting as a shunt in between two different circuits with a potential difference between them. I know it's all very complicated stuff, but such is the nature of electricity. So far as you need to know, you need to see something that looks pretty good as far as a wet connect approved uh, connector for your pool pump, and you should see a bonding wire. I'm in Canada. We use the the unshielded wire here for our bonding wires. In the US, where, where you're probably located, yours should be shielded. It's also a different gauge. So you'd have a green wire, not a bare copper one like this. Here we are looking at the inside of the electrical compartment for a variable speed swimming pool pump. And these little guys here, these are the test leads that they run the pump with at the factory before they ship her out. Most of the time, you're not going to be using those things. In fact, maybe all of the time. I'm not even sure if you're able to use them, but you don't want to anyway. You want to make a permanent hardwired connection here, um, and it's really easy to do, and I'm not showing you how to do it. Again, as I said earlier, if you don't know how to work with electricity, if you don't understand the, the theory behind it, if you can't test for it safely to know that it's it's dead and not energized right now, you shouldn't be working with it. But there is a popular video out, video out there about swimming pool pumps that I don't want to go all Peter Griffin on you here, but it really grinds my gears because they do something in that video which is absolutely not something you should do. And also, if I'm honest, something that reveals right away that you really don't know what you're doing with electrical and you have no business making electrical connections. So I'm going to show you something because you should know this. So first of all, we've got these these little connectors here. These are your uh, L2 and your L1. This is where you're going to provide your uh, electricity, either your 115 volts in a neutral or 215 volt legs creating 230 volts. Those are your options here. The thing I want to show you is the actual connection point. So I've just got a little piece of wire here. I'm going to go ahead and strip that out. Bend a little hooksy. Okay. Now this isn't a real installation because obviously you know you'd be using other wire coming through here. So this is what that other video did, which you should never do. So they make their connection like that, and then they tighten. The problem with this is you can probably make a sound connection with it, but you'd get fired from day one of your electrical apprenticeship if you tried to get away with it. Much like Teflon tape, when you apply it to the threads, if you do it the wrong way, it backs off as you tighten as opposed to getting tighter. Anytime you make a hooked connection like this with electrical, you have to factor this in. There we go. And now as we tighten this, it grabs the wire. Here's what's so important about this. If you make a connection and it backs out, first of all, you could have live conductor making contact with something that it shouldn't be, but hopefully you haven't stripped that much of your wire away. But what else can happen is you just come up with a poor electrical connection. Maybe you're making contact, but maybe only in half the places that you're supposed to be. This pump draws an enormous amount of power. That's the current part. And part of this equation is that we're going to lose some of that energy to efficiency loss in the form of heat. Resistance in an electrical connection will build heat. When that happens, the wire itself can itself increase in resistance, creating this downward cycle where heat creates resistance and then the resistance builds more heat, which builds more resistance, which builds more heat. And eventually you end up with a house fire or at least a fire here with your swimming pool pump. Sound electrical connections for anything in your home are important, but a heavy draw current device, something with a continuous operation motor like a swimming pool pump, oh boy, is it ever important to make sound connections? And if you're gonna be the guy on YouTube showing people how to do it, 
I sure hope you know what the heck you're doing. And when you wrap the conductor around the screw the other way, the very first thing in the video, I sure as heck know that you don't. So go ahead and fix that on your video, please. Well, that was like a little more angry than I wanted to take that, but you know what? Safety. Safety first, L1, L2, and ground. Those are gonna be the three options in your electrical compartment, no matter what kind of pool pump you have, but the voltage that you have and where you put the wire is a unique case by case basis. This is basically the individual question that I can't answer, answer for you. Up until now, we're just reviewing general observational level stuff relating to swimming pool electrical installation or swimming pool pump elect electrical installations. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want you to damage your equipment or anything like that. And that's purely the reason why I can't just give you easy information like where do I hook the black wire and where do I hook the red wire? I hope you understand. Bonding lug, grounding lug, bonding, grounding. Boy, they seem so similar, even the words. And look how close together they are. It's not the same thing. If you say to somebody, oh, hey, I noticed that my pump wasn't bonded when you installed it, and they say to you, oh, don't worry, there's a green wire there, a small one attached to the ground lug here, which came in on your electrical, you know, uh, service. So you have your, you know, black wire and your white wire and then your green wire. That's all you need, right? It's grounded. Not enough. It also needs to be bonded. So if you see an empty bonding lug on your pump or your heater or anything like that, I would recommend that you speak with a local electrician specifically somebody who is experienced with swimming pool installations and the difference between bonding and grounding as it applies to swimming pools. Again, to reiterate, this information is not so that you can go outside and start monkeying around in the sub panel near your swimming pool installation. This is purely for informational purposes so that you can have a better understanding about the equipment that you own. So a very common question that pool owners have about their pool pumps relates to the voltage supply. In a residence, you're going to have 115 volts or 230 volts. 115 volts is the regular plug in your home that you'd use a blender or a vacuum cleaner on, and 230 volts would be your electric, stro electric stove, electric dryer. Those are your biggest appliances. For a pool pump, smaller pumps can get away with 115 volts up to in and around one, one and a half horsepower on the label, depending on the service factor. All of the pumps bigger than that will require 230 volts. And most pool owners, or many pool owners, let's say at that point, say, well, I, I don't know what I have. How do I tell the difference? And I don't want to tell you, well, you use a multimeter and you can measure it because now you're into touching stuff with potential electricity. I don't want you to do that. I want you to only observe. And using only observation, we're going to deduce something here. So my swimming pool pump is 230 volts. And I'm going to show you where it is on the panel here. See this doubleton right here? We got a single 15, and then we have this doubleton. You can see the bar connects the two, and then we have a single 15 again. So basically, and ignore the, the numbers, these are amperages that apply unique to my situation. Those don't apply to yours. What is important to you here is the fact that you have single ones, which represent 115 volt circuits, and then you have these double ones, which represent 230 volts. So if mine said pump right there in black marker, then you would know for sure that this one here is 230 volts. And if you know that the breaker for your pool pump looks like this, then you have a 230 volt supply to your pool pump. If your breaker looks like this little guy or one of these ones, something like that, again, completely ignoring the numbers, those are unique to your situation. That's how you can tell what voltage supply you have for your swimming pool pump without having to actually touch anything, open anything, or try to measure any of the voltages. Looking at this installation again that we were in front of earlier, I bet it makes a lot more sense. I bet you're immediately able to point out different aspects of the system that you see here, like a sweep elbow here on the pressure side, or you might notice that we have inch and a half pipe on one side of this three-way diverter valve complete with unions. We have two inch here. I wonder if that's the skimmer line and that's the main drain line. That's what I would do if this were my system. And we have a nice straight run into the suction side of the pump using two inch pipe, a CPVC union supplied with the manufacturer, 
there's a coupling here. It's not as good as it could be, but it's not too bad. When installing a swimming pool pump, the actual cutting and gluing of the pieces, the Lego building blocks that go together to install the swimming pool pump, it's not really the hard part. The hard part is knowing what to use, what the right materials are, what the wrong materials are, where to leave space, where to put the fittings. All of this stuff that we've covered in this video is all the difficult part when it comes to installing the pump. Perhaps something that you would benefit from knowing, because I think a lot of a lot of people would benefit from, you know, if you're installing a pump for your first time, you go out there and you don't really know where to start. You kind of have a good idea what's going on. You know in your mind what it's going to look like as a finished product, more or less. But how do you actually get started? And this is how you actually get started when you install swimming pool pumps professionally. Typically speaking, you walk up to the area, you unbox all of the new equipment that's going to be installed, you cut out all the old stuff, because often it's not just the pump, you might be doing more stuff as well. And then you place the pump first. The pump is the first thing that you install. So say, say you are installing more than just the pump, we're going to start with the pump because it's just a good place to start. And in particular, we're going to start with the suction line. So maybe you have an intake manifold built already, you're just dropping a new pump in place, no problem. Maybe you have to re-plumb yours into something that makes a little bit more sense hydraulically speaking that's pretty common in any case we really don't have you know too much to do here other than just get the suction lines together in such a way that you can get them pointed straight at the pump at the right height that they need to be with an adequate adequate straight run into that suction side intake it's not that hard to do you have to make sure that the pipe is not leaning or it's not under stress, you know, a couple of little things. But when you start with the suction line and connect it first, it's kind of easy because, the, you know, you're not fighting against anything else. The pump is just sitting here. Put it wherever you need it to be. Plumb into it, make the connection, and leave it connected while we begin, we begin exploring the remainder of the plumbing, usually the connection from the pump to the filter. So here's kind of like the catch that you can get into when you're doing this kind of plumbing. It's like with painting, you hear how you're not supposed to paint yourself into a corner. Well, it's kind of the same thing here because we have the length of the glue slip. So at some point, we kind of run out of room. And how do you make that last connection? We start here at the pump intake, we plumb this first, and then it comes to here, but how do you make the last connection so that everything fits together exactly the way it should? And all pool professionals will pretty much do this the same way. So let's say I've glued all this in place. We're just working on this, but I haven't completed this connection. Either this one or this one. Somewhere there's one connection remaining. So how I would typically make that connection is I would disconnect my union. So right now this is moving. In fact, I'll show you. Okay, so now, here you can see it's all loosey-goosey there. We've got to reconnect this because we need to ensure that this pump is sitting exactly where we need it to be. And you make your last connection. So we take the primer, we take the glue, we apply it to the fitting, we apply it to the pipe. We put that last thing together and we can do that because we can lean this out of the way enough that we make the fitting and then quickly put it in place and that's how you do it. You, you make the final connection with the union. Use the union connection to help facilitate that final connection and do it really quickly. You have just a few seconds when you're solvent welding PVC between the time that you insert the pipe into the fitting until the time when it's set, you can no longer move it. Depending on the temperatures that you're working with, like one to three seconds, something like that. In that one to three seconds, if you work very quickly, you can place that final connection together, put the union together, and, and then now connect it. And now you know, as that glue is setting, there's no strain or anything like that. The pump is sitting as natural as could be because we, if there was, let's say, let's say this pump was a quarter inch too far away from the filter. If we set the fitting and let it set, and then attempted to connect it, well, that union might actually not seal. You might have a gap there that it's just simply not able to bridge. But if you put all that glue on there, and we set the fitting, and then we put the union together and we tighten it, 
and we notice this is backed out a quarter inch, something like that, well, it's still going to be a sound connection there. Visually, I'll be able to see what has happened here, but you can make up a gap with something like that versus something like a valve, you can't. So I never like to put something like a swimming pool pump together with the plumbing without physically connecting the unions right into the system as you're completing the final connection point. I hope you have found this detailed walkthrough of swimming pool pump installations and how to do a better job with swimming pool pump installations to be helpful. If you did, please like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and you can check out my website, swimmingpoolsteve.com.